David? Okay. So first off, Jennifer. Hi, my name is uh, Jennifer David Wache. I'm Shapelo Cree, First Nation, Northern Ontario, now live here in Ottawa. I used to be the Director of Communications for the Aboriginal People's Television Network. I then started my own consulting company in communications, and now I run my own management consulting company here in Ottawa, and I just wrote a book about the launch of APT. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Formsma. I live here in Ottawa, um, go to go to this school, but different faculty, and um, I'm also a filmmaker, and I host a radio show on CHUO that focuses on Indigenous issues and perspectives. And what time is it on? Tuesdays, 9 to 10 p.m., CHUO, 89.1 FM. <laughs> Hello, my name is Howard. Um, I also live here in Ottawa. Um, I'm a filmmaker and uh, also a really involved in the film industry, I guess. Uh, I was uh, one of the organizers for the Sinapka Film and Media Arts Festival this past summer in Ottawa. It was in June. Uh, we had uh, like a week of um, film and uh, media and art galleries with um, media art installed there and uh, so and I'm a graduate of Carleton. <laughs> <laughs> so the way this is gonna work, um, I'm gonna ask some questions and have each person speak to um, each question. And um, there will also be a chance if anyone has any questions from the audience, um, please feel free. So I think the first question is um, when we're looking at indigenous perspectives and representations in the media um, we wanted to start looking at by looking at the mainstream, mainstream media, and uh, what what are the strengths and weaknesses of the coverage of indigenous issues and peoples in the mainstream media? So, so let's get some thoughts. Well, I'll start that discussion. Uh, my experience, of course, is with APTN, and the reason APTN exists is because there wasn't enough coverage of Aboriginal people or Indigenous issues on mainstream television. Uh, when we were arguing for a national Aboriginal TV network, the CBC said, well, we're doing enough already. We've got, at the time, the show North of 60, and they had a show called The Res, which, you know, if you watch it, kind of fun and interesting. But if you look behind the scenes at North of 60, the number of Aboriginal people who were actually behind the camera, directing, producing, writing, was very small. The res was even based on a book that was by a non-Aboriginal writer. So you can't tell me that that's you know, Indigenous representation in the media. And that was the reason why we fought long and hard for APTN. And there, there was some, you know, you could see Aboriginal people on television, but all you ever saw were stereotypes. I remember when we did a promo video uh, about why we needed APTN, and this one Aboriginal guy, actually he's a photographer here in Ottawa, and he said, you know, when I was a kid, the only Indian I ever saw on TV was the test pattern on CBC. <laughs> like, you know, if you remember from the 1950s and 60s, so that's kind of sad. So <laughs> there was obviously a need for another perspective and another voice, and that voice had to be um, Indigenous-led, it had to be from Aboriginal people and not another, you know, well-meaning, you know, white person who says, oh, I'm going to tell your story for you. It had to come from Aboriginal communities. On, uh, on my show, we, we spent a lot of time uh, looking at mainstream coverage on a number of different issues. We sort of scan the, the Twitter sphere and um, the, the news and, and um, TV to some degree, but mostly, mostly news and sort of the, the, the issues of the day. And then we take them and, and we sort of look at them as to say, okay, well, how, how is this being portrayed in the media? Uh, what, what are the bases that they're, they're coming from? And a lot of times you can see that there's just a lot of um, misunderstanding, ignorance, and misrepresentation. And um, one of the, the issues that we focus on, we focused on a lot, especially with um, October just passing, was the uh, missing and murdered Aboriginal women. And we had um, someone who actually had done some research on uh, missing and murdered women in the media and looking just at how they're being portrayed, um, the use of their name, of the women's names, uh, where they're located in the, in the newspaper article, uh, 
just things like that. And it's, it's really easy when you sort of line up the things um, all in a row to see that um, there's just a very much lack of understanding um, and doesn't seem to be improving, <laughs> sadly, over time, um, which is really sad. And I think um, the strengths would be that, I want to say that it's improving, and I think that there are areas. Um, for example, the CBC did the 8th fire, which I thought was actually pretty progressive. Um, but I still think in terms of uh, you know, news, um, TV, movies, I think they're probably one of the, the worst uh, ones. But uh, they're still very much lacking in, in being able to, one, um, provide some accuracy to Indigenous peoples in terms of like, you know, not, in terms of showing the diversity of Indigenous peoples, um, and then also being able to be sort of like what Jennifer was saying, to tell a story from, from a genuine place. Well, um, I'll say a few things. Um, you're talking about the CBC Indian that it was used, uh, with, it was with, um, was it with like time code bars or whatever, mm -hmm. the color bars? Yes. Um, one thing I've heard um, a lot of older Native people talk about is how they, the only Native people they saw on TV were like in Westerns, mm -hmm. and they were they were always like, they when they were kids, I've heard a couple older Native people talk about how when they were kids they remember cheering for the cowboys because, you know, that they were the good guys, right? The Native people were the bad guys. So there's some weird irony there where the only iconog iconography on television or in, you know, mainstream media was negative portrayals of, of Indigenous peoples, so um, that's one thing that that made me think of. Um, and another thing is stereotypes. I think stereotypes are huge, huge in in mainstream media, uh, with like specifically like news, television, and print media. Um, stereotypes are still very prominent. Um, I did some research, <laughs> and um, RCAP um, had three stereotypes. They said. Um, that were really prevalent. Uh, there was like the, the victim kind of stereotype, uh, you know, these pathetic native people, indigenous people's pathetic vi victims. There's you know, the drunken Indian, um, native people in poverty, drugs, sexual abuse, all those negative things. Um, and then there's also um, a, a kind of opposite kind of, uh, uh, um, I guess, imagery or stereotype of uh, the angry warrior. Um, you know, with like bandanas and mm -hmm. guns and weapons, and that's sort of like another stereotype. <coughs> and, <coughs> and then there's also the environmental um, stereotype of native people, like, I don't know, just really always being fighting for the land. Not that they aren't, but just this really exaggerated stereotype. Um, <coughs> so I think those stereotypes are, um, I don't know, they're really important to, to I mean, they're still they're still present in a lot of media um, because I think a lot a lot of the problems with like news and television and reporting is that they really have like these tight deadlines and so when they have a story they have to pump it out really fast and they don't really treat topics with as much complexity as they might necessarily need um, so they end up kind of relying on these stereotypical ideas and images images. And it, it doesn't really do, a lot of media I find doesn't do justice to the complexity of stories and even the complexity of identities that indigenous peoples have. So that's some thoughts on problems with the media that are still out there. And there's a, there's a movie called Real Engine, which is R E E L Engine. And I actually haven't seen it, so I just wanted to know do people recommend that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's very good. Can you explain a bit about it? Well, it's basically, a, a, I can't remember what his name is, but he's a journalist and he's kind of going on this journey in history to look at perceptions of Aboriginal people on television. And he goes goes through the Westerns and, you know, really shows how how, how terribly stereotypical and, and racist in some senses it is and trying to actually find where the sort of real story is. And that's his, at the end of the day, what he says too is that what's out there in the mainstream just, just isn't accurate. You know, and I just want to comment on a couple of things. One of them was, um, you know, talk, you talked about the eighth fire, and I do think it's great. If any of you have a chance to go on their website and, and see any of the stuff that was done, it's great. But you know, having worked in this area for a long time, 
about 20 years ago, there was a series on CBC called All My Relations, and then about you know 10 years ago, Carla Robinson had a series on News World. You know, so it's like you know every once in a while, CBC will say, oh, we better start, better do some Aboriginal stuff. And so they do this nice little series, throw a little bit of money at it package up as the little thing and then it's gone, like that's it. So I think what's missing is the consistency of being able to continually have that voice in the media universe um, that I think the mainstream just isn't capable of doing. Yeah, um, Real Engine also goes through different waves of, of um, viewing Indigenous peoples in the media. So it wasn't just, you know, sort of one way. At, at one point he talks about like they were actually really positively viewed um, in the media. I mean, it was still stereotypical, but it, was, it had a positive spin on it. And then sort of through time, like it's twisted, it became a negative stereotype, and then it became a different, you know, these ideas sort of what Howard was saying about like the, the honorable, like the angry Indian and the environmentalist and things like that. Um, and it's, it's really, it, it actually is pretty uplifting <laughs> to, to, to see how far we've come to the point where people um, have been telling our story for us to where I think we are now where there's a, there's a huge community of indigenous media makers. I mean, we're, we're <coughs> all, you know, representation of that. Um, and certainly the work that APTN has done over the last 20 years um, in developing a pool of producers so that it's, it's indigenous content by indigenous people, for indigenous people, um, and things like we just came back from the Imaginative Film Festival um, in its eighth year or something? Thirteen. Like? Thirteen. Thirteen. <laughs> Way off. Same as ABTN. <laughs> was, ABTN launched a month before Imaginative. And the quality of the movies that are there, I think, is, is really um, quite stunning. Like I've been going the last few years, and even just in the last three years, just to see the quality today is, is amazing. I think getting back to the negative things about the media, um, there's, um, I, I know you've all seen this, it's like when there's some sort of article, let's get an opinion piece about indigenous, indigenous issues, it's like a lot of those editorials and opinion pieces in like newsprints, a lot of those are very, like some of them are outright, outright racist, and then, or, or they're just, they're, the way the media treats the story, they, they they polarize the issue, so it's like us against them, like non-native against native, and they, they really they, they set up that kind of duality of the story, and then the, they, they they simplify the story in a, in that way, so that it doesn't really give the audience much information to really like, and all, often there isn't the context, the historical context. So when you set up a story, say you're talking about residential schools or you're talking about, you know, land claims of some sort of land claim, without that context of, you know, colonialism and the Indian Act and all this legislation that led to, like, the creation of these things, um, I mean, that's so important. And so I find in, in media those things are often absent. Um, and, all, and also, again, um, that sometimes editorials and things like that are blatantly racist against Native people. And that's, I know you've seen like the comment feeds after an article, and those are filled with just like, you know, a lot of negativity. Like, why don't they just get over it? It's kind of mentality. And it, it's um, like, get over what? Like, genocide? Um, colonialism? Um, like, it's, it, I don't think it's something that is, um, I, don't, I don't think it's, you wouldn't say that to like a Holocaust survivor. Get over it. <laughs> I also think there's not enough media awareness in general in Canada. I think that people, like if I look at the United States for example, you know, your average person in their house turns on the news and they turn on Fox. So they get their news from Fox and they think that's the truth, that's the story, that's what it's about. And it's happening in Canada. You pick up the National Post and those of us in this room are obviously savvy enough to know that's a very right wing perspective on Canada. But your average Canadian reads the National Post and thinks that's what everybody thinks. That's a Canadian paper. That's a Canadian viewpoint. Well, it's not. And I think Canadians don't have enough, in general, sort of knowledge to be able to read their media with a little bit of uh, 
a grain of salt. Like you have to look at it and say, where's this perspective coming from? Where's this journalist coming from? Who owns this publication? Like there's a lot of things that I think the average Canadian doesn't do when they look at the media. And so Aboriginal people have to fall into camps depending on whatever the media is too. And that's just that's just the way it works. People need to understand that. I guess the next question is, um, after, after talking about the mainstream media and, and what problems there are, um, how do you see indigenous created media as being different? Okay, how much time do we have here? Okay, <laughs> so that's why we're here. Okay, well, first of all, I'll, I'll keep talking for a little bit, and then I'll give it to somebody else <laughs> as I get on and on about this. Okay, um, the three words that I use in my book is exactly what we were talking about earlier. Aboriginal people have either been victims, we've been villains, or we've been vanquished. So those are the kind of the three main stereotypes that are out there about Aboriginal people in the media. And Indigenous media breaks down those stereotypes and gives you another perspective. The thing is, is that sometimes the things that Aboriginal people wanted to say in the media are sometimes even more difficult to hear than what the mainstream would do. I remember early on in APTN there was a, there was a, a, a television series that was very popular and it was called Moccasin Flats. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but it was a series and it was uh, it was a dramatic series and it was set in a, a, a very poor inner city area of a Canadian city, but really it's like Regina. And it's a very tough series to watch. It's about young people, it's about gangs, it's about prostitution, it's about horrible things, alcohol, drugs. And I remember when I was at APTN and in communications, people would say, we don't want to show that those kind of stories. Like, there's already enough stereotypes out there. But this, this was actually Aboriginal producers that said, we want to tell the story. This is our story, and this is what we want to tell. So you've got to watch both sides too, right? You can't censor these Aboriginal producers who now want to tell these tough stories about their own communities, but right? I have a comment on that. Um, one of the producers of that, I think I believe it was Jennifer Podemski, yes. and she also had up, had produced another show on APTN that was very positive of yes, success it was. stories. It was. So um, as, as media makers, um, it wasn't like they were only focusing on negative things, like they've done other shows that are very, very positive, focusing on, focusing on success stories in Aboriginal communities. So uh, I, the way I see that is they're telling stories, they're both true stories, they're both like yes. come from real places. Yes. And um, I don't, so I, I don't think that it's, like I think there was a lot of complexity to the stories in Moccasin Platts. I yes. thought that like there was a lot of people struggling to make their lives better. Yes. So. I think I think there was a, it wasn't just the stereotypes of like the drunken in Indian or you know I think there was a lot more complexity to the to that stereotype. It wasn't just a one-sided, one-dimensional stereotype. So I think that's something to think about. Oh yeah, for sure. But again, it was interesting to see that there were even those kind of complaints. It's like finally here's people telling story, and then there's people saying you shouldn't tell those stories, right? So um, well, just on on the radio side. Um, I've, I've been doing, well, The Circle, which is the name of the, the radio show, has been almost, it's been almost four years now that, that the show's been on there. Um, and I think it's one, like CKCU has uh, an indigenous show as well that plays on Sunday mornings, mine's Tuesday evenings. And um, other than those two shows, I'm not too sure how many other indigenous programming there is in, in radio uh, within Ottawa, Gatineau area specifically. Um, and there, there are some indigenous uh, radio producers uh, across Canada, and we, we, we try to talk to each other as much as possible. Um, but it, it really seems like that was an area that um, I really wanted to indigenize that, that space. Um, there, there's a lot of talk about um, decolonization in, in terms of academia and the work that we do, trying to decolonize how our approach is. Um, and then sort of the, the, the other side of that is, is indigenizing, so populating the spaces with indigenous ideas as opposed to removing colonial ideas and then um, operating. So I felt like radio was, it was, a, way, it was a way to indigenize airspace. Um, and so I, I keep that in mind when I'm, when I'm doing my programming. Um, and so I bring on people that aren't going to be traditionally heard within the mainstream media setting. And one example is that we had um, a DJ Indian who is uh, Ian Combo, uh, who started a campaign against the Nepean Redskins. 
um, their uh, football team here in Ottawa, out in Nepean, their logo is the Redskins logo that Washington uses. And um, Ian said, you know, that's not right, that in my own community um, that we have this um, negative perception or the, this negative um, portrayal of Indigenous people by virtue of the sports team, local sports team. So he went, it, it got popular, it hit the media. Uh, it was in Sun, it was on CBC, it was in the Ottawa Citizen, like all over the place. And, and, and talking to him, he was like, my voice got whittled down to the sound bite or it became this one page newspaper where he got a quotation in it. Um, and so I said, come on the show. So we brought him on the show and we had a full hour to discuss the, the issue in detail. Okay, so what are the arguments that are being made for keeping the, the Nepean Redskins logo? What do you think about that? Um, what do you think should be done about this? And so we had that t full time in, in a safe space for him because I wasn't trying to get him. I wasn't trying to, you know, I was trying to pull the story out and allow him to tell it in the way that he, he wanted to tell it. Um, as one example, another one that we did was on Halloween costumes. Like, how many media out there were talking about racist or inappropriate Halloween costumes? Um, and so we went on, I went on the air on one of my shows close to Halloween and said, you know, Please be uh, responsible in your choosing of Halloween costumes, um, that people aren't costumes. Uh, I was speaking mostly about people dressing up as like Indians or Pocahontas or, uh, you know, that whole range. Um, and <laughs> so hopefully, you know, some people heard that and, and were able to do it. And then some of the other people, I, I want to kind of wrap this piece up, but um, we've had like the families of Sisters in Spirit, um, we've had some environmentalists uh, that coming coming on and talking about their story in a way that they want to share it. Um, and I think that's really, really important um, to have a radio show and being supported by CHUO, who is really open um, to, to allowing me to create that programming in the way that I think is best. So um, yeah, so I, I think um, there could be a lot more indigenous content on the radio, uh, but I think the, the small community that we have is really supported institutionally by the radio stations that, that support us. And so, I, well, I guess the question was, um, how, how, is it, how is indigenous um, representations of themselves through media different? Is that the question? Well, I guess it would be completely different. Um, for one thing, they don't generally don't stick Native people generally don't stereotype themselves when they portray themselves. You know, um, they're generally not they're generally not blatantly racist against themselves when they're, you know, producing imagery or some, you know whatever kind of medium about. Um, and often, you know, it's their own voice. It's their own you know it's agency to their own <coughs> voice, their own perspective. Um, and um, so you get a lot of more of the complexity of not only identity but also like historical context to issues um, and, and I find those are the things that are really lacking in mainstream media so um, but um, what, what Jocelyn was saying uh, we, I, I think we can't not talk about what a tribe called Red does <laughs> as like a little um, being in Ottawa um, and what they do with um, imagery and, and um, I don't know if you've ever been to an electric powwow but um, they, they, they're or know who um, they are, but uh, they're uh, a tribe called Red. They're three, three indigenous um, DJs, and they do shows. Um, but um, like Bear Witness is their their film guy, and then um, and then so they do music, but they also do video. Um, and really, a lot of what they do is about kind of taking racist stereotypes of imagery that is in like cartoons uh, of you know, or video games, um, music videos, they take that imagery that's kind of very stereotypical and they kind of flip it on its head and they, they make it their own. And they, you know, they, like Bear Witness edits videos and he, you know, completely takes things out of, out of the context, out of that racist context and, and, you know, makes it different, makes it, you know, decolonizing that imagery. Um, and they do that with their music as well. Um, I can think of, there was one song that was like, it's like, from all directions or something. Do you know that one? <laughs> yeah, that there's that one too. <laughs> there's 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 one that's like from all directions, 
and they actually grabbed that sound bite from like a, a movie or something where it was about native people coming from all directions to surround like a, a settler in their wagon or something. But they took that, that sound bite out of context and what made it about, you know, a, a gathering of people, like native people from all directions coming together to, they made it about unity. And they made it, you know, they made, they completely turned it on its head. So I think just what they do as an artist collective in a group, I think is really symbolic of what indigenous peoples do in media in general, and that's to, you know, take back their own representations and how they're portrayed. Um, I would uh, highly recommend if you haven't seen it. In fact, I first saw it here at a film festival in Ottawa 20 years ago. It's called Barbecue Area. If you haven't already seen it, highly, highly recommend it. It's from the 80s, so it's kind of dated. Um, but it's basically a story from an indigenous filmmaker in Australia who basically turns the entire colonial story on its head. And it starts out with a group of these little white families having their barbecue by the river. And in comes this boat with these three indigenous guys with their flag. And they stop and they say, who are you? Where is this land? We claim this land, this barbecue area. It's very, very funny. It turns everything on its head. And anybody who sort of had these sort of stereotypes will really, it'll make you think twice. So recommend it to all your friends. You can find it on YouTube. Baba Q, I think B A B A K something Baba Q area. Highly, highly recommend it. It's very fun. You, I just want to add one more thing about what you said earlier about uh, giving people. Indigenous media gives Aboriginal people the time and the space to tell their stories. And I'll give you an exact example of that. When I first started, the precursor to APTN, if any of you know the story, was called Television Northern Canada. And this was a, a group of northern broadcasters and community video and filmmakers uh, in the Northwest Territories, in the Yukon, and in Nunavut, Northern Quebec and Labrador. And they were developing their own stories. They were using video, they were using satellite technology, and they were telling their own stories in the way they wanted to tell them. And what that meant was, when you watched a show from TVNC or from the Inuit Broadcasting Corporation or NNBY in the Yukon, the pace was much slower. There wasn't these quick edits, it wasn't these sound bites, it wasn't you know, some expert up there talking about things. It was the camera following somebody on the land while they're getting their nets ready, while they're putting their nets in the water, while they're explaining why they do this and how <coughs> their, their elders have taught them that this is what you're supposed to. And it was, you're engrossed in this story that's being told, but it's not this, you know, the way that the Western view of media is it's got to be quick and you've got to be in and out in a minute 30 and tell the story. This was a long way of telling stories and for some people that was hard to take, uh, especially those of us who grow up, you know, with, with Sesame Street and, you know, video games and stuff, but it was, it, it allowed the community members to tell those stories the way they wanted and I think there's room for that um, when you look at APTN. It's got room for the high fast pace, cashing in, and you know, those great stories, Blackstone or whatever, but it's also got room for community stories and the ability for those people to tell the stories the way they want. When we were applying for the license for APTM, Gary Farmer was one of our supporters and he said something that I found was very profound. He said, you know, we, we want this network not just because we have our own stories to tell, because we do have our own stories to tell, but he said we have our own way of telling our stories that, that the rest of Canada doesn't even know about. And he said, we need a space and an opportunity to tell them the way we want, and we want to tell the stories we want, and the way we want to tell them. Uh, consume, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> consume Indigenous media. Uh, that, that is a big issue. I mean, the, what we're seeing is, like, you know, the... CRTC and, and media being where it used to be sort of like this is now becoming really pillarized that you've got one big company owning like everything underneath so they control TV they control movies they, like they've got everything under that one column and so then you know where there's the little guys <laughs> that are supposed to be competing with these people that have just deep deep pockets and can do all kinds of really, um, really crazy things <laughs> with media um, under that. But I think that um, it's also where the media comes from is, is the community. And I think that's really what uh, has 
kept a lot of indigenous media afloat. I mean, we've got so many newspapers in Anishinaabeg Nation. Like, they're rooted somewhere. They're not, because they don't belong to, to big conglomerates, um, but I think they're a lot more free in, in a lot of ways. Um, so it is an issue, and I think that's a very real risk um, in sort of getting lost in, in that. I'm not going to pretend to have any magic bullet say, we've got to do this. But I think um, by having a larger, a larger pool of producers that are creating media, um, by having more filmmakers that are creating movies, um, one of the, the, the final film at, at Imaginative was The Lesser Blessed, with, which had um, Benjamin Bratton in it, and it aired at uh, the Toronto International Film Festival. So I think uh, to have that level of caliber of, uh, of, of an actor um, coming on board and a very well-produced movie, like it, watching that was, was really, it was a good movie, and based from a book um, by an Indigenous writer. Um, so I think the only thing that I can really think of is, the, is to populate, to populate the, the media um, and to have our people consuming our own media. And I think that's, that's really what speaks in volumes to, to keep people in the business, basically, is just to keep that, you know, and hopefully build that circle wider and wider so that we can keep doing what we want to do. I would just add that it is worrisome, but I think less worrisome now than it would have been 20 years ago. People, especially younger people, they're not, they're not watching mainstream media, they're not watching CBC News, they're getting whatever they want off the internet, they're going wherever they want to get whatever news they want, and I think it's going to just get more so that way. So I think that's good for independent and Aboriginal media, because I think that you know, whoever owns you know, Sun, the Sun newspaper, it's going to be the same older white people that read that paper, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's fine. It's, those aren't the people that I think that are trying to get their own sort of news from a wide variety of sources. So I think that Walmart is maybe not as much of a, of a threat as, as, you know, maybe some in the mainstream might go. But again, it goes back to my, my issue about media awareness, about, you know, not knowing what choices are out there and where to get other sources. So like Jocelyn says, read those alternative papers, you know, comment on on things that are, that are being said in the in the mainstream and in the alternative press, uh, support those those uh, alternative media, and and then that's how they'll continue. I'm not sure I have an answer. I think they answered. <laughs> <laughs>
and you can present perspectives, but every single media outlet has perspective, and there's nothing wrong with that. You watch any film of Alanisa Bomsawin, they are point of view perspective films, and you know what you're getting when you watch them. You just gotta know where that perspective comes from. And the mainstream is trying to appeal to the broadest possible people, but what you see in the Ottawa Citizen, and what you see in the Ottawa Sun, are different stories, even if it's the same story, written very differently for a different kind of clientele. So they do all this research and figure out who their audience is, and generally that audience is not very diverse. <laughs> so that's why the stories are not as sort of diverse. And because of this conglomeration we were talking earlier, they're now pulling stories and getting stories from other regions and not doing their own research and stories locally. They're picking stories up from, from other media who've already done the story somewhere, somewhere else. So I think a lot of people are rejecting that mainstream um, viewpoint. It's not media. I mean, look at the Sun. They just they just fired half their half their entire news staff because people are not reading the Ottawa Sun for their news. So where are people getting it? They're getting it somewhere else. And there's lots of other places to get it. And the internet's the place where people are going to look. And you're just gonna. I mean, if you, if you don't know, you want a certain story, you'll just Google it, or you'll just go on YouTube, or you'll just try to find who's out there talking about a particular issue you want to know about. People don't pick up newspapers anymore and read it cover to cover. Um, yeah, and just on that, um, in terms of how, how I get stories, um, I really draw on my network to, to do that. Um, uh, I've been working in uh, sort of youth advocacy, child rights, um, nonprofit, um, sort of an indigenous, you know, with friendship centers and assembly of First Nations and uh, through my work life, through my volunteer life, I've built a network of people that are doing really great things in the, in the communities that are attached or connected into, into these different areas. And basically, I, I keep my eye on them. What are they talking about? What are they seeing that I'm not seeing? Um, they'll post things to, to Facebook. I get emails about things that are happening. Um, I, I read Twitter. <laughs> so my, my network really is, um, a lot of it's online now especially now that I don't, I don't have television, <laughs> I have, uh, don't have cable. But the, I, get, I try to get my information my, from people. And people saying that this is important to me and posting a link about something that's happening. Um, and then trying to pick that up and, and see who else is talking about similar things and then you know, asking them to either talk to it on the show or um, sort of working through that. And then um, just on the, the filmmaking side, I haven't talked too much about the filmmaking side of things, um, is that I really, um, I look for stories sort of like the, what a lot of TV shows do, they take the grain, they take the grain of truth and then they grow it from there. I, I prefer to do drama fiction. Um, so I take the grain of truth uh, of a story and then I try to create something out of that grain um, that, doesn't look anything like that actually exists. It's a fictionalized version based on um, that grain of truth. Those would be what is being reported in the mainstream media to pick up your continuation of a particular point or a story. Yeah, I think it's really important um, to do that because it's it's out there. People are consuming that new story, and I think it's really important for me to take that story and say, this is what I think about it. You know, I usually will, and I, I do my rant, I do these rants on my, on my show. Um, so I take the thing and then I just like, you know, pick it apart as much as I can. Sometimes I get really angry and sometimes I get really sad. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important to take, okay, this is what they're saying to us. Here are the pieces in it and here's what I think about it. You know, and that's what I try to do with, with, with all my shows. Well, I mean, there are lots of big issues. I mean, you look at something the Auditor General has said time and time and time and time again about the deplorable A conditions among Aboriginal people, the wastefulness among government departments dealing with Aboriginal people, and not very much is still getting done. So I think most people have given up on the mainstream media as being a source of information, and so they're not responding to articles because they're not reading them. No, you see, that's not the question. The question here is, what is in there? We are talking about the chart, the government, the, the, the quality rights or the rights which are guaranteed under the charter. But I'm we've never had a lot of those I'm rights for many years. 
about the charter? What is the argument of the charter? Mm -hmm. Well, I think if we started getting into justice and the legal, we might have to be here for like, the rest of the day. But I think in terms of like the media perspective on on what you're talking about, I would just say this about it: is that um, in both internationally and and regionally, in terms of Canada, um, there are specific statutes or not statutes. There, there are specific um, articles within conventions that say that Indigenous peoples have the right to their own media, to have the right to, to access media that's created by them for them. And, and one, one example is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Another one is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And they haven't made it into Canadian law in terms, like these are just like, you know, aspirational documents as the government will say. They haven't made it into Canadian law. And so they don't have to do it. So then it's not up to, we're not going to wait for government to, to to do something for us. We're saying that what, I was, what my point was about the indigenous media sort of has been into the alternative media realm and it's connected to community and I think that's really the important part is that we need media that's going to represent us and that's not going to come from anybody else but us. APTN first. Sorry, but the question about APTN was about languages. Yes, even when we launched the network, we were making a commitment to languages. I don't know what it is now, but when we launched it, it was something like 20 something percent of programming had to be in indigenous languages. So that really that really built an entire production community. I mean, how are you going to do a whole shoot in Cree if you don't have, you know, your cameraman has to understand Cree or, you know, so that was very encouraging to be able to say, we want to have this many shows and we have time slots for them, so go and produce them. So for sure, there's definitely room for that on, on ATN. And your second question was, sorry, again, about... Oh, just, just whether it's worth making the... Effect oh, yeah, cultural sensitivity. Oh, them. cultural sensitivity training should be done <laughs> everywhere to everybody, but I think... If you look at, take the American, uh, the American uh, election that just happened right now. The Republican Party is all in a big huff now because they're realizing that they don't have their base of voters anymore. And I think the mainstream media is starting to realize the same thing. It's not a bunch of old white males who are, who are consuming media now. It's young, diverse people who want other perspectives. And they're having to sort of wake up. And if they want to stay in business and they want to have viewers, they better start writing stories and attracting the kind of viewers that, that, will, that are represented here. So I think there is some encouragement there and looking at the American election, it's exactly what, what happened. Yeah, same, oh, go ahead. Pat. I was going to say, in terms of mainstream media, I think um, a lot of, like, I, I would say the majority of people that are in mainstream media making stories about indigenous peoples, they are not indigenous themselves. I would say that on the whole, they're mostly non-indigenous people. So. I think it's really important to have that cultural sensitivity training um, about those issues because, like, they might be writing a story about something they have no idea about. So I think it's, that's a really important thing. That's important to say. And we are starting to see more Aboriginal people in mainstream. Like, if you do watch CBC on TV, Duncan McHugh is an excellent journalist, and he doesn't always talk about native issues. Right? We're we're getting out of having your you know your typical you know whatever, writer only writing about those issues or reporting on those issues. I mean, Duncan McHugh writes about, I've seen him talk about all kinds of political issues. So that's a good thing, right? We're getting out of that, that ghetto, right? That stereotype. And in, in entertainment, same thing. I mean, now you can see Lauren Cardinal as a police officer in Corner Gas instead of being a stereotypical whatever. You're seeing Adam Beach, he's a pilot instead of Squanto, you know? So we are, it is, there is some change. And yeah, it's the same, uh, APTN is now optioning a lot of their programming in uh, indigenous languages. So they're, they're requiring their producers not only to produce in English or French, but also to, to option it in, in Cree or Dewe or Mohawk or whatever um, language is, is, is around. Um, and hope for changing the media. Um, that's, that's kind of, I'm just imagining, you know, like Sun Media, Ezra Levant taking uh, you know, cultural sensitivity. Uh, I, I just don't see that happening. Uh, but, I mean, we can chip away at it, right? 
Um, and somebody, I actually just did an anti-oppression workshop yesterday, and uh, we were talking about you know the need for taking more cultural sensitivity and anti-oppression training, things like that. And somebody was like, you do fire drills at work. You know, you make sure that the system works and that people know what they're doing. And sometimes you even go through the motions of you know doing the fire escape, you know, just in case someday you need it. You may never need it. You hope that someday you never, you know, your, your office doesn't catch on fire or whatever. But you do that training anyways. Um, and nobody ever says, that's ridiculous. We don't need fire safety training. Um, you know, I'm pretty fire aware, you know. <laughs> but if you apply that to, to the human context, you know, I think um, we can always be less oppressive. Um, and for me, you know, there are certain cultures that I feel like I'm, I'm proficient and I understand, and there are so many more that I don't. And so even for myself, I could certainly learn more about other indigenous cultures. I could certainly know more about <coughs> other communities that are around us that may be consuming indigenous media and may be more prone to following indigenous media and to, to um, attach themselves to it because they see um, some recognition of their own cultures represented in there. So um, hope, I don't know, hope, hope, find hope is, is so, um, it's, it's almost inactive, you know, I feel like we need to do more than hope, we have to, we have to act on it, because um, if we just hope it's, it's not going to, it's not going to happen, we actually have to find the action in that to, to change the media if that's what we want. So, on that point of changing the media, or creating our own, I think, um, <coughs> I think that's a really positive thing. I mean, we have imaginative, but we also have film festivals popping up all over Canada. Like there's like indigenous film festivals there. Um, there's a new one in Sudbury called the Weekush International Film Festival. Um, the Sinap Cup Festival is, just had its inaugural year here in Ottawa last summer, this past summer. Uh, Bean Ducate Film Festival in Thunder Bay is in their, in their like third or fourth year. So, I mean, indigenous people are really creating, you know, there's a lot of stories to tell and these festivals are starting up to tell them um, and those are kind of alternative. Star in Saskatoon has one already. Doug Cuthand does one and it's excellent. In Saskatoon? Yeah, the Saskatoon feed, Star Phoenix. Had, mm -hmm. He's been on, he's been doing a regular call there for 10 years. Right, okay. Yeah. Any other question? But you guys would, you, you'd like to see, you know, more? Sure. Okay. I mean, to say, I mean, there are two things on that. Like one, yeah, the, the Timmins, um, the Timmins Times or the Timmins Daily Press also has a, a weekly Xavier. I can't remember his name. Uh, yeah, Xavier Kadawapit, Kata, 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 um, who does a weekly column like that. And I mean, it, it's good because he, he talks a lot about where he comes from, and so I think that's good. And the, the second piece of that. So yes, the question, the, the simple answer is yes. But then, I also um, would not want to see that person sort of outside of the the realm of, of criticism. Like I'd like to see them in the mainstream, but also not being that person that speaks for us. You know, um, just to recognize that the, the diversity. I would say check out the Imaginative Film Festival website. Um, See, Imaginative Film Festival in Toronto is probably one of the largest indigenous film festivals in the world. So if you want to see what, it, it's not just specific to Canada, it's an international film festival. So that will give you, just, you can try and search for those films on your own and you can get access to them somewhere. Um, is that work? Uh, it's .org, yeah, Imaginative Fest, I think Imaginative.org. Um, and also Isuma TV, I-S-U-M-A, Isuma TV, they're like an Inuit, um, film kind of organization and they post a lot of their videos online. Um, what else? Uh, well, APTN uh, puts a lot online. APTN, yeah. Oh, yeah. APTN.ca. Yeah. 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 And they've got a lot of stuff. If you just plunk around their website, they've got a lot of. Okay, because I don't have cable either, so I don't like <laughs> yeah, you can get them on the internet for sure. And if you're going to read an indigenous newspaper, I would read Wind Speaker. It's called Wind Speaker. Don't know their website, but. Or Anishinaabe News. Oh, that's Ontario based, yeah. Which one? Anishinaabe uh, News. Her blog? Oh, 
Oh yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I can't remember oh, I can't the name either. of it. It's a uh, yeah, it's a Cree word, and I can't remember. It's like Apple. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll look it up and I'll put it on there. Um, native approach. Is there, is what time is it at? Um, okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, one we'll more the board. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the, the question I have, um, which will maybe wrap this up, um, I just wanted to ask you about your personal experiences um, with, with making media or being involved with media or maybe even something that influenced you way back that got you on a path where you became involved with media. If you could just talk about something, something you learned or something that inspired you that people may be interested in. Go first on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I'm a filmmaker myself, um, and I guess, um, and also kind of one of the organizers of the Cinema Festival in Ottawa. And I guess, um, in terms of like starting the festival, I was definitely inspired by other indig indigenous film festivals and having been to those festivals and seen seen the amazing stories that are told, um, and and being in Ottawa, the capital of this country and you know not having that here not having an indigenous film festival it's like well there's certainly something missing in the city so um, me and a couple of good friends we said we should do this so so we did <laughs> and so in terms of being inspired it comes from you know seeing that other people are telling their stories through film so that there's a space to show those films so yeah I'll leave it at that <laughs> um, well, there's two, like for, for filmmaking, um, it, it was really, I was brought into it by a mentor of mine. She, she actually was a filmmaker, and she was also the regional chief for Anishinaabe Aska Nation, and she worked with the youth council, and I was on the youth council at the time. She said, I want to do this film project. So she got the youth council to, to create the idea, um, and then she helped us um, put our vision into, into film. So we did two of these, and I was like, this is really cool, this is really fun, and just like the, the, the rush that you feel when you're on set, and you're like shooting things, and then, you know, like to see it from beginning to end, something I was like, this is amazing. And so um, when, I, when I was here in Ottawa, I applied to Saw Video for a Jumpstart grant, and basically all you have to have is an idea, and then they support you with um, getting the training and getting mentorship to help you see your vision through. And so um, I had the interest, and then I found uh, there were these opportunities to be able to explore these interests and then the support to see the vision through. And so now that I've done, um, I guess, four videos in total, I'm, in my, I'm doing my fifth one right now, um, I just want to keep doing it. It's, like, it. it's something that I've become to really love. And so I want to keep doing this like forever. <laughs> you know, I don't have to be great at it. I don't have to be award-winning at it. I just want to do it because I love it. And then in radio, uh, my friend, um, she started the circle, uh, and I individually got radio training uh, through CHUO, and um, same thing, like just by being a part of the process, um, I really became to love it, and I think radio is, is such a, it, it seems like an older, like older form of communication, but it's still so relevant, and, and I, I, I just love the, love the format. So again, like I think that there was, I had the initial interest. Um, there were opportunities that, I, that were available that I could explore, and then I had the support to, to be able to follow through. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, something that really inspired me, and again, I'm not a filmmaker myself, but uh, I'm a communications person, and I feel very strongly about promoting uh, Indigenous filmmakers and, and anybody who, who has an Indigenous perspective on things. I feel very strongly about being able to support them. And uh, when I saw Alanis Obamsawin's film, uh, Kanasatake, 280 Years of Resistance, if you haven't seen it, go see it. See it from the NFB. 270. 270, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Has it been one then? Okay, there we go. <laughs> wrong. Uh, it was, uh, I think that was um, sort of life changing for me because it was kind of the first time that I really thought about uh, point of view documentaries and how Alanis was behind the barricades during the Oka crisis, that this, this was a film that she had incredible access to actual people on the ground and how this was influencing them. And I realized then, because you know, this was happening and these came out right when I was sort of at the end of journalism school and thinking through all these things that, you know what, there's more than one perspective on every story. And you know, who gets to tell those stories? 
is really important. And when you watch and listen and hear or see any story, it really made me start to think about who's telling this story, why do they have access to tell that story, and do I need to take everything they say in that story at face value, and are there other stories? So that really got me thinking about that, and, and what really made me passionate about APTN and the need for APTN. And I think that, that, that all of us need to do that as Canadians, as consumers of media. Where is this story coming from? Is this a valid person to be able to tell this story? And am I going to listen to this story? Am I going to do something about it? Am I going to find another way that this story is being told? Am I going to tell a story or add to that story? So, you know, we come from a, a really strong storytelling tradition, and I, I, I believe that. I think we've got all places and times and the ability to tell stories, to listen to stories, and to share stories. And we need to decide which ones those are going to be. And uh, I'll do a, a one shameless plug, because I wrote this book, if anyone would like to buy it, I'll read it. <laughs> it's $25. If you're a student, come and see me, and I can sell it cheaper. I want you to do a plug, actually. Um, so again, The Circle, so there's, there's the book. Uh, original yeah, People, did. Original Television, it's called. <laughs> It just came out last month, I wrote it, but the launch of APTN. Cool. And the circle's on Tuesday nights on CHUO from 9 to 10 p.m. And you can stream it online or you can listen to uh, 89.1 FM. <laughs> and the Sinapka Film and Media Arts Festival, right there, is uh, it's, it's going to be happening again next summer in Ottawa, so look out for that and come and see some Indigenous film. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Nation's capital. And as someone who went to most of the most of the screenings, I Thank would you. say that Howard did an and his team did an amazing job for a first time around and had incredible <laughs> venues, had great films, and did a really wonderful job. So I'm really excited for next year. So please come next year. Yeah. <laughs> all right, and I want to thank you all um, for, for sharing your perspectives, and, and thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Thanks for the opportunity.